The one who was born in a manger was born so that he might come and crush the head of the serpent. And that is why Christmas is such good news. That is why Christmas is to be celebrated with so much joy. Not because a baby was born in a humble stable, but because that baby came to save people from their sins. Because he came to destroy the works of the devil. Do you realize that you and I do not have power over the devil? We don't have that on our own. Right. Only through Christ Jesus do we have power over the devil. Amen. And we were born into a world uh, as we were created to love God and to praise him. By our very nature, we hate him. We rebel against him. We do things that are right in our own eyes. We walk according to our own ways. And we do everything except for what God wants us to do. Yet, in the midst of all of the judgment of this sin that takes place, in Genesis chapter 3, we see that small kernel of hope. And that small kernel of hope is developed throughout the rest of Scripture. It is the rest of Scripture that explains exactly how the seed of the woman will crush the head of the serpent. Friends, this is an important passage because if you understand this passage wrong, you will understand all the rest of Scripture wrong. If you do not understand what this passage means, then you will not understand your need for a Savior in Jesus Christ. This is the reason that the Christmas story gives us hope. Some years ago, the uh, Parade magazine ran a story about a man named Eugene Lang. Uh, Lang was a self-made millionaire. And he was invited to go speak to a, a sixth grade class one day about his success, to encourage the students, to help them to, to be motivated to be successful like he was. The problem with the speech that he was to make in front of this sixth grade class is it happened to be at a school in East Harlem. Now, as Lane went to speak to that class that morning, he looked at 59 sixth graders, all of whom... Uh, statistically speaking, or statistically speaking, the majority of whom would never even graduate from high school. And he had had this long speech prepared, this motivational talk to encourage them, and he realized as he looked at the eyes of those students that their situation was one in which they really had no hope. They had no hope in escaping the circumstances that they lived in, and they thought to themselves that whatever this man has to say, is not going to be of any value to us because we're stuck here in Harlem and there's nothing that we can ever do to get out. And he could tell by looking in their eyes. And at that point, Gene Lang took his notes and he crumpled them up and he threw them away. And when he looked at that class of 59 sixth grade students in Harlem, he implored them simply to do this. Stay in school. And he said to them, if you stay in school, I will pay for your college, for every single one of you. He thought that's the only way that he might give them hope. And I want you to know they followed this story over the years, and it's been calculated that some 90% of the kids that were in that class not only graduated from high school but received college education with the help of Mr. Lane. He came in, in spite of their circumstances, he offered them hope. Do you realize that's what Genesis 3 is all about? The seed of the woman who is none other than Christ Jesus himself. He comes in spite of the circumstances that we find ourselves. Even though we are lost and we cannot find our way out. We cannot rescue ourselves. Left to our own devices, we are damned for all of eternity with the serpent. Yet he has loved us enough to give us hope. In Christ Jesus. But there is one thing here that I find troublesome about this passage. And before we conclude this passage, I think that it's necessary that we at least talk about this. Because the thing, the thing that I find troublesome is if God had decided to destroy the works of the devil. If God was prophesying right then and there that the head of the serpent was going to 
be crushed. Why wait so long? Why do we need to go through all of this? Why all of the murders and all of the torture and all the lies and the adultery and all of the other terrible things that are taking place in the world? Why do we endure all of this? How come he didn't put an end to him right then and there and just destroy him? Why didn't he throw him into the lake of fire and leave him at that point forever and ever? Why did he allow him to run around and to roam around the earth for so long and to wreak havoc in the way that he did? Why? And that's a troubling question. It troubles people because people say, if God is a good God, then how come he lets so much evil happen in the world? And the answer is right here in Genesis 3.15. He allows evil to happen in the world in order to pave the way for the cross of Jesus Christ. Amen. Because a world in which Jesus dies on a cross is more glorious than any other world that could have ever been created. Amen. Why did God not wipe out this, the, the devil whenever he led Adam and Eve into temptation in the garden? Why did he not wipe him out whenever he rebelled uh, sometime uh, after everything in creation was good? That can only be answered in the cross of Jesus Christ. God's glory can only be known more fully as we look at it from this side of the cross. Had we not looked at it from the cross of Jesus Christ, we would, we would fear God's judgment and we would recognize his holiness. But this side of the cross, not only do we recognize his holiness and still fear his judgment, but we also adore his grace and we cherish his mercy and we love the Jesus who hung on that cross for us because he made a sacrifice that we could never make for ourselves. Through the cross, we don't just fear judgment, we also adore mercy that is given by the holy God of heaven and earth. St. Augustine is the one who, who used to proclaim that, that the cross is the pulpit from which Jesus Christ proclaimed the love of God to the world. And I want you to know today that that's exactly what Genesis chapter 3 is all about. The first mention of Christmas doesn't come through the Old Testament prophets. It certainly doesn't come as we read the story in the manger. It comes in Genesis chapter 3. Last weekend, the children... Uh, had a Christmas party, a birthday party for Jesus. And I, I like the theme that we had this year because it was a Charlie Brown Christmas party. And I know I talk about this every year at Christmas, but I really cannot help myself because out of all of the kids' Christmas movies, there is none better than Charlie Brown Christmas, I believe. You, you know, Rudolph is great, and Frosty the Snowman is great, and Jack Frost, but none of those capture the message of what Christmas is truly about, do they? But Charlie Brown's a little bit different, because as Charlie Brown and all of his friends are preparing their Christmas play, Charlie Brown is so frustrated, isn't he? He is so frustrated over the commercialism of Christmas, and he just doesn't know what to do. He's depressed, and he's beside himself. And as they're in the theater preparing their play, Charlie Brown throws his hands up in the air, and he says, well, somebody please tell me what the meaning of Christmas is. And this is why I love that movie, because at that point, as Charlie Brown throws his hands up in frustration, out walks Linus. He pulls his little blanket behind him and he walks out into the center of the stage and the spotlight comes right down on Linus. And while all the other kids are kind of looking with a, uh, a bum-fuzzled look on their face, Linus says, Charlie Brown, I'll tell you what Christmas is all about. Today, in the city of David, there was born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. That's what Christmas is about, Charlie Brown. And that's why I love that movie, because that is exactly what Christmas is all about. Two days from now, we're going to wake up, and most of us are going to enjoy good food, and we're going to enjoy opening presents. We're going to enjoy spending time with people that we love. But I implore you this morning, please don't forget Christmas is truly about. It's about the birth of the one who came to crush the head of the serpent. 
Christmas is not just for you and me. It was for Adam and Eve as well. The birth of Christ Jesus into this world. Plague and problem that has infected the whole human race. And only through him can it be cured. That makes Christmas a wonderful, wonderful thing. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we are so grateful that you have looked upon us with such grace. Lord, we know that in our sinful state, we do deserve to be damned for all of eternity to live with the serpent, Lord. We deserve to inhabit the domain of Satan himself. Father, on our own, we have earned nothing more than eternal separation from the Holy God. And Lord, as we try to climb our way out of it, as we try to come before you based on the good things that we do, based on the scripture that we memorize and the sermons that we preach and the lessons that we teach and the songs that we sing and the good deeds that we do, Father, all of those things fall miserably short of your glory. And there's nothing that we can ever do in the church or out of the church to acquire standing before God such as you. But Lord, even in the midst of all the judgment that took place in the garden, even as Adam and Eve were being judged for that sin that they committed, Lord, you provided a kernel of hope for us, for them, and for us, in telling us that the seed of the woman would crush the head of the serpent. And Father, as we celebrate Christmas this year, I pray, I pray, Lord, we might exalt the offspring who has crushed the head of the serpent on the cross itself. Father, we praise you for the cross. As we look at the cross, we see a sight that the world calls morbid, and the world calls ugly and disgusting. Uh, but for the eyes of the Christian, it is a beautiful thing, Lord, to behold the blood that was shed on Calvary. Because in the shedding of that blood, Lord, a rescue, a salvation has occurred for people that will trust the one who came to crush the head of the serpent. Father, we praise you today. We give you glory. We give you praise, Lord. We pray that you are exalted because of what happened through Jesus Christ. And it's in his most precious name that we pray. Amen.